The gospel lesson this morning is another parable from Jesus. It is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's also found in the Gospel of Thomas, but this is not in our official Bible. Many scholars think that Thomas' version of the parable is the most accurate because it is more simply told and doesn't have any commentary added onto it by the writer or the early church. Luke most closely resembles this early version. Here's the parable as told by Luke. Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next, he sent another slave. That one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he sent still a third. This one they also, also they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Heaven forbid. Here ends the reading from Luke's Gospel. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time hearing this parable and not thinking immediately about the ways in which we could hear this as God and sending prophets into the world that aren't heard and then sending Jesus the Son and then the humanity killing him out of greed and selfishness. Especially we feel this way because Mark, Matthew, and Luke all have a verse similar to the one that John just read. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them who killed the son? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. At the time of the early church when it was separating itself from the Jewish community, because if you recall, for a while they were all kind of behaving as one. Christians believe the Messiah has come, but they still went to the temple and they still went to the synagogue. But as the early church separated itself from this community and more and more Christians were Gentiles, people who were not Jewish, then the message that Jesus was for others who would listen and those who didn't would be lost, this part of the message helped that early church stand on its own. That particular reading of the parable seems appropriate as we approach Holy Week and Easter, but I think there is more to this parable than the obvious allegory that we appreciate at this season. There's food for thought here about messages and messengers. When we listen, why we listen, when we don't. What helps us see and understand the messages around us? What happens when we see messages we don't want to hear? In ancient times, when communication between nations and cities and villages came in the form of messengers, literally human couriers, who carried important news on foot or on horseback, being a messenger was not such a popular job. Some places you were messengers, you needed to literally be a very swift runner. You would need to run in one direction, offer the message, get the reply, and run back again in the other direction. Sometimes you needed to be a diplomat to help difficult news be accepted by those who needed to hear it. The messenger might actually be authorized to negotiate things before returning to his master. This was very careful work. Miscommunication could be an absolute disaster. So this job of messenger meant that you were very trustworthy and you had a great deal of responsibility. But sometimes when the news was particularly difficult, people or leaders might not want to hear what the messenger was bringing, then the messenger might be tortured or killed and then sent back. And his sorry state would be the answer, would be the response to that message. Thus the little phrase, don't shoot the messenger, was born and lives on. It is really not so very different today in some ways. The, while the world of diplomacy and negotiation seems to follow very civilized protocols around the world, how many times in the midst of all that do we see, have we seen hostages held for long periods of time or killed in order to send a message? 
And when those diplomatic channels fail, as they sometimes do, how many times have nations sent a message with a bomb or an attack of some kind, some other way of shooting the messenger, letting them know there is displeasure? How many peace-loving, non-violent leaders have been assassinated in order to silence them and send a message of fear to those who would follow? We think of obvious people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King, but in this world, there are many, many more. Shooting the messenger is in itself a kind of message. It says, I don't like what you're saying. I'm angry and I'm powerful and I'm going to react by taking it out on you. This can be true for other reasons when we talk about our interpersonal relationships. When we don't like we, what we hear from friends or family or others, we might lash out or go on the attack in some way, tell them what's wrong with them and try to turn the tables. Marriage counselors will tell you that one highly unfair way to argue in a relationship is to use offense as a defense. So the wife tries to explain to her husband that his drinking is hurting the family. And instead of hearing, he reacts by saying, oh yeah, oh yeah? Well, if you just cleaned the house a little better and took more proper care of our kids, I wouldn't be drinking and we wouldn't be having this fight. And now somehow it's all about her. He has turned the tables so it's not about him. Shooting the messenger in an attempt to kill the message, especially when there's some way in which the messenger and the message are tied together, that is what happens quite often. And I think that brings us back to the parable that Jesus told and eventually to Jesus himself. This rich man, this owner of the land, his son is very much tied to the father. After all, he is the heir to the land. He was a messenger, but he was also connected to that message. It's as if his presence says, I'm here for my father's crop, which is also mine because I am the heir. So don't forget that this land doesn't belong to you. The tenants see and hear him, and what they see and hear is somehow their father, the father, and they greet him with selfishness and anger and hostility, and they plot to kill him. They kill the messenger senselessly hoping that by doing this, they're killing the message and somehow they're going to end up with the land being theirs. We can see the foolishness of that from afar. Those who were most threatened by the message of Jesus in his time were those that saw his message as a challenge to their authority and the way they lived. They saw his presence, the way he engaged the outcast and the lost ones, how he healed the broken and the brokenhearted, what he taught about the kingdom of God. They didn't want to hear this or see this, let alone live that way themselves. This was a threat to their power and their, uh, their prestige. Somehow in killing him, there was hope that his message would die. We're here today as evidence that shooting the messenger doesn't necessarily kill the message. In fact, sometimes it fuels the message. There is a problem when we look at this parable and use it as an allegory to talk about Jesus and God. It isn't perfect in so many ways in my thinking. The owner is an absentee landlord who is far, far away from this land that he owns. That is not my experience of God as being far, far away. The owner keeps sending others in his place even though they're being hurt. It seems like he doesn't care. That's not my experience of God either, and certainly not what Jesus taught. The owner then sends his son into this dangerous situation. There's no evidence whatsoever that the son is going to be respected or accepted. In fact, quite the opposite is true based on everything they have done so far. There's no evidence that the landlord really knows anything about these tenants or what the problem is and why they are behaving the way they do. Intentionally sending anybody into harm's way, being unaware of the world that God has set in motion, that is not my experience of God and not the understanding of God I have learned through Jesus. 
So I have some trouble with this parable being a way of thinking about God and Jesus and messages, messages and messengers. But there is a story, there is a more recent story that I think shows something of Jesus in the way in which he was messenger and message. This parable, this little story was what I was told when I was quite young. And it offered me for the first time some kind of real understanding of who Jesus was and why he lived as he did. I don't know where the story came from. I tried Googling it to see if I could find out more. I couldn't find anything, but I do know that it was popular in the early 60s. And I remember the gist of the story after all these years. Let me tell it to you. It was deep into the winter season and snow was heavily on the ground and the winds were howling and the temperature was dropping well below zero when this Midwestern farmer looked out the windows from inside of his cozy house. He realized it was going to be an especially nasty night and he was glad that he was tucked safely in his home by the fire. A rustling sound outside caught his attention and he peered as best he could into the darkness. There was only just a little bit of moonlight and he could see shadows and he realized that huddled together close to his house, as best they could huddle together, was a flock of geese. And they were huddled in order to try to escape the storm. The farmer knew that they would not last through the night they clearly had lost their way in their migration, and the storm was making it impossible to fly, let alone to sit anywhere in the snow and cold and be safe. He couldn't get them out of his mind, and he got this idea. He pulled on his heavy coat and his boots and his hat and his gloves and his scarf, and he stepped out into the cold, and he, he found the rope this was something you did on farms in the past. Maybe they still do it. He found the rope that led from the front door of the house to the doors of the barn because when it was as awful as it was outside, you could lose your way. You could not see. And so he inched his way along this rope until he got to the barn and he worked to open, to slide open those barn doors thinking, if I can just get those geese inside, they will be safe from this dangerous cold. But he realized immediately they couldn't see what he had done. So he found several lanterns in the barn and he lit them all and he placed them where there was this blaze that highlighted this door. And it's like, surely they can see this. Surely they will come now. Well, he could tell the geese could see, but they didn't move. They didn't move at all. They had no idea that this barn, that this light was a place of safety. The farmer sat in that barn for a long time. He felt incredibly sad because the geese were surely going to freeze in the night and the warmth and safety was so close. But they were too afraid and they were too cold to move. He thought about going inside and trying to shoo them in, but he realized it was just going to scatter them and they weren't going to necessarily run in that direction. He thought about picking them up, trying to catch them and carry them in and he knew these were impossible ideas. They were too afraid of him. They would not understand if he tried to do any of those things. He had honestly done all that he could, so he walked back to his house. And as he walked back to the house, he thought to himself, I wish just for tonight that I could be a goose. Because if I was a goose, I could go to that flock of geese I could be one of them and I could show them this is the way to the barn and you don't need to be afraid. If you will just follow me, you can be saved from this storm. And that's where the story ends. And I don't know if you hear it the way I hear it, but there it is. This is the whole understanding that comes through in scripture. Our human limitations are such that we have no capacity to really see, really understand God in this message of love. And sometimes when we do live in this world, we are so afraid we miss the point. But then we have Jesus, who truly was and truly is one with God in such a way that when we see Jesus and learn of Jesus, we see and learn of God in human form just like us. And when God is with us, God can help us set aside our fears and bring us into the light of love.
In this way, Jesus was both the messenger and the message. We, too, can do that, you know. That's what Jesus invites us to do. In fact, if you're trying to be serious about following Jesus, that's what he commands us to do, to live the message of God's love. Message and messenger all in one. That's how I would define being a Christian. That's how I would describe what it means to be a disciple or to follow Jesus. The Jewish philosopher and theologian Abraham Heschel said that man is a messenger who has forgotten the message. I think that is an interesting idea. Man is a messenger who has forgotten the message. It does offer a challenge to us. Have we somehow forgotten the message? What exactly is the message about the love of God in my life? What is it I want to be sharing with my words or my actions about this great love? Hey, how did I receive that message? How did I come to appreciate this love? Am I living in such a way that I could be that message in someone else's life? Do I look like someone whose life is changed by that, who has joy and hope, who can be honest and unpretentious? Those are good questions. Another question that rises for me is how some people do offer this message. Are we people who think that maybe we need to scare people a little first with some bad news about how sinful they are so that the good news of God's love will be that much more compelling? We know that message is out in the world, yes? That is the way the message of the love of God comes often. Now, what I want to say here is that while there are some people in this world who surely need to be held accountable for the harm and the pain that they cause, I suspect most of us sitting here and most of the people we know are people who struggle more with the feeling of being already unlovable and unforgivable and guilty and grieved, struggling to even comprehend that God could love us. And Jesus' message of love, then, is one of hope. And it's much-needed message of comfort and relief and courage and joy. And once we sort of catch that in our minds, we realize we haven't forgotten this message at all. We have not forgotten this message. We maybe just don't know how to share it. Or maybe we're worried we won't do a good job of sharing it. Or maybe, just maybe, we're afraid of being shot. After all, Jesus was crucified. They did, in fact, shoot the messenger. Well, my friends, it's true. The death of Jesus is something that we have to admit and have to look at in this season of Lent, but we know it's not how the story ends. However, this is the perfect place to stop today with the death of Jesus. It's the perfect place to stop during Lent. Easter doesn't really mean much at all if we have not acknowledged the crucifixion, if we don't face what it can mean, the fears, the challenges, the pain, the struggles, what he had to overcome to live and die as both the messenger and the message of God's love and forgiveness. What he needed to do in order to be the messenger and message of life in the kingdom of God. And so for us, the work of Lent together is to discover and discern, to find ways to be that message and that messenger of God's good news. And when we do this, in all the little ways and big ways that we find to do this, then the kingdom of God is revealed. It's revealed within us and among us and beyond us. May that be so. Amen.